Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Talk with a Doc, a thought leadership series brought to you by HealthSnap, where we hear from the nation's leading healthcare experts on their perspective of technology's role in patient care post COVID 19. My name is Samson Magid, and I'm the co founder and CEO of HealthSnap. Joining me today, we have Shashi Yadiki from NTT Data, a global IT innovator delivering technology enabled services to customers around the world. Shashi is the president of the health plan business for Entity Data and has transformed the business unit into the fastest growing unit over the last several years. Shashi, thank you for your time today and we appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Samson, glad to be here. So I thought we'd start off with a quick introduction to yourself, uh, to your organization, and then I think it'd be great also for our, our listeners to, to hear a little bit more about your career path and how you got to where you are today as well. Sure, again, glad to be here. Uh, I'm Sashi Yadiki, uh, President of Health Plan Business and NTT Data. Uh, NTT Data Services is an IT services arm focusing on digital transformation of our clients. Uh, we are part of a $100 billion NTT group. Uh, about me, I started my career working with clients in uh, the consumer and retail business to do with the healthcare. Uh, it was the likes of Target, Pepsi, Walmart, uh, Neiman Marcus, and also some hospitality organizations, you know, think about cruise lines and restaurants. They all focus on consumer and their needs and how do you address them. Uh, I got into healthcare and health plan nine, nine and a half years ago. It was not planned, it was an uh, uh, accident. I took over a, a book of business uh, related to health plans and uh, I could see a large gap in consumer experience focus in healthcare. Uh, at the start, I remember uh, talking to my own team members or the clients, and they would not like the word consumer. Uh, they want to use the word member or patient. Drastic change. So what we did was, what came to me naturally in understanding the consumer behavior, uh, leveraging the power of data analytics, member experience, we brought all those capabilities and technologies to healthcare. And today, if you see the convergence, it's real, uh, even in the industry. Uh, if you think about, uh, about CVS and Aetna combination, uh, that's a retail and healthcare coming together. And you would see a lot more of that. Our business has been built on core principles of a startup. Uh, our focus has been to drive digital transformation for health plans, wherein we are using the power of uh, automation analytics and AI to drive what we call as member provider and broker experience into it. So that's a quick uh, introduction. No, it's a perfect segue into uh, our first talking point today. And uh, it's fascinating hearing individuals coming from different backgrounds and applying their knowledge to healthcare, which historically has been um, in much need of a shakeup. So I'm curious, the last year has been, um, I would say transformative in terms of how technology is being incorporated into patient member or in this case, consumer care um, as well. So I'm curious, um, during COVID, how has Entity's strategy around uh, innovation changed um, as a result of COVID-19 and how is technology uh, at the forefront of, of all that work you're doing? Yeah, the pace of technology change in healthcare uh, has always been slow compared to other industries. And I sort of briefly mentioned it in the introduction. A pandemic has changed that completely. Uh, there has been a significant change in the adoption of technology in healthcare. Some of it was, I think, forced to, I, I would say, it was forced on it, on healthcare industry as such. A uh, lot of people refer to about five years of digital transformation uh, being done in six months. Uh, whether it is adapting business processes, you know, complying with the regulation, move into a virtual setting, pandemic has just changed all of that. So let me share a few areas that, uh, uh, you know, come top of my mind and, and share my thoughts on them. Top of the list uh, is virtual care. And I think it's a no brainer, right? Um, there is an acceleration of virtual care, uh, which involves telehealth, remote monitoring, care coordination. Um, I'm not an analyst, uh, but in discussions with the clients, uh, when I talk to them, whether it is the health plans or the related areas, you would see the adoption of virtual care has gone from about 10 to 11%, they, they would call it, to nearly 30 to 40%, depending on who I'm talking to. And this is not a digital substitution, wherein you replace 
what was happening in a physical setting in a hospital to into a Zoom call or a WebEx call, right? Uh, it is a transformative uh, uh, end-to-end remote uh, monitor, remote management, right? Of, you know, wherein you're able to look at uh, bringing in the value of asynchronous care management, wherein you can check somebody's health by symptom checker, as an example, and then connect them on a plan for remote uh, care, and also have a coordination with the hospital. So uh, clearly, it's an end-to-end capability that we see that is exploding. And I believe it has also got a strong support from CMS. So that's really the first one that has changed a lot. I want to quote uh, uh, what we had done a few years ago. Uh, interestingly, we had started in telehealth uh, six years ago. Um, remember putting a significant amount of money to build a reference architecture for a kiosk solution. And we piloted it with about four or five health plans. We could not see any traction could not see it. Uh, now, those same health plans have significantly driven the overall end-to-end virtual care. In terms of our solution, we have a digital health platform wherein we can help uh, people by providing what we call as a digital front door capability, whether it is finding a doctor or a symptom checker, we provide that. That's the capability we have. Uh, second on the list, Samson, is uh, uh, interoperability. Um, we have been talking about interoperability in healthcare for a long time. Uh, since the time I joined, everybody spoke about it, but I didn't see large movement because there was this friction between health plans and providers. And pandemic to some extent has changed that. I've seen health plans have supported providers in their ecosystem, uh, uh, in the regional space, and that has helped to foster better relationships and also this uh, uh, solution related to five standard compliance, right? Uh, that has been adopted while to some extent it is compliance. I think it's a big step in terms of bringing uh, uh, the two big players, the health plans and providers, part of the healthcare ecosystem coming together. I think this is the first step in building transparency in the, e- in the healthcare ecosystem. That's massive uh, from where I stand. Again, even in this space, we had invested a lot to build solutions and we've got interoperability solution that is not just targeted towards the current scope of work of compliance, but to help them in providing end-to-end transparency. So that's uh, the second one. The third one that has changed in from a patient care perspective is data uh, intelligence and AI. This is my favorite topic. Um, you know, if there is one area of healthcare that has got the maximum amount of investments during this pandemic, that's uh, undoubtedly AI. Uh, there is, you know, if you use the word exponential growth in AI, uh, you would not be wrong. Uh, I remember um, talking to uh, clients three, four years ago about uh, using virtual agents, just compare and contrasting it. Uh, they would not even venture into pilots. Today, the same clients, uh, it's a very automatic thing to, to implement conversational AI chatbots. You know, that's sort of a big need during the peak times of pandemic, every healthcare agency have adapted it. That tells you how much uh, has changed during COVID and how technology has enabled it. Um, in terms of uh, other aspects of AI that we have seen, you know, all backend processing, which requires documents, we, we have seen acceleration of it. Um, we use uh, uh, you know, aspects of uh, NLP, OCR techniques that help to read the documents, uh, be able to self-learn and be able to you know, uh, parse that information into the intelligent systems. So uh, we, we have seen an exponential growth there. And lastly, uh, the one that I believe truly drives patient health is an investment that we've done in chronic care uh, detection. Uh, We've used uh, AI um, on top of large sets of data, which is both payer and pharma data, uh, and analyze uh, for six conditions, right? Uh, Which which are chronic conditions, whether it is uh, diabetes, 
COPD, um, uh, arthritis kind of scenarios, wherein you can correlate large amounts of data and are able to predict before the condition arrives. This is a significant impact potentially to reduce the cost, which is part of the 3.3 you know, trillion dollar number we keep hearing. So those are um, some of the top of my mind uh, priorities that I believe have changed so much during uh, COVID-19. Fascinating, Shashi, and, and um, all very relevant um, in, in the work that we do at HealthSnap and, and um, what we're seeing out in the real world. So it's fascinating to hear the, the things that are top of mind for your organization. Um, I've personally heard over the last several months, especially um, just the concept of uh, the proverbial genie being out of the bottle of virtual care. Um, you touched on some really, really just uh, personally passionate topics for me about disease prevention, leveraging yeah. technology, AI, machine learning, NLP to um, satisfy um, disease prevention at scale and support uh, payers or providers uh, or pharma organ organizations. Um, Number one, I guess my first question is, do you feel like virtual care is, is here to stay? Um, are we at a point where there's no, no going back? Um, or do you feel like things will uh, go back to uh, things as status quo post COVID? Um, and then number two, what do you feel like are some of the biggest challenges um, right now as we do look forward and we say, hey, virtual care is definitely here to stay. Um, what needs to happen next? What should people be thinking about, whether it's uh, entrepreneurs, uh, pharma, payers, provider organizations, um, how should they be thinking about incorporating uh, some of these topics into their strategy uh, as we look to move forward as well? Absolutely. Virtual care is here to stay, Samson. I think uh, that's very clear. Um, what we call as a contactless experience, uh, I believe, uh, you know, it, it may not go to the levels of 90% uh, growth that we saw in the first three months of COVID, wherein uh, everybody was using the virtual care, but uh, it is going to be integrated into what we call as a mainstream healthcare. It is not a separate stream by itself. I believe it gets integrated into the holistic care management uh, of an individual. So, um, that's how we see, and that's how the solutions that we're building um, will be targeted. It won't be one solution for telehealth, one solution for care coordination, one solution for uh, uh, you know, giving information about doctors. No, it is, it's going to be an integrated uh, solution. That's what uh, I believe is the change um, that is going to get normalized. In terms of um, uh, you know, what challenges that we see uh, for virtual care. Think about the life cycle of um, um, uh, the virtual care, right? Uh, you're looking at uh, the data that needs to pass from each of these uh, dimensions, right, of activity. Today, the solutions that we have in virtual care are in silos. They are point solutions. Uh, nobody is looking at a, an end-to-end -end capability that you are able to deliver in the care continuum of, uh, of a member, um, whether it is engagement solutions, whether it is outreach solutions, whether it is assessment solutions, or the actual patient service. So one uh, feedback I would have for anybody who's venturing into this area is look at it holistically, right? And uh, you know, don't look at just a piecemeal solution uh, of those individual areas. If we are able to solve the passing of data seamlessly in that ecosystem, right, or the supply chain of these virtual key transactions, I think we've got a great outcome. Um, I still think it is in the infancy stages because I just spoke about the whole interoperability. We took so long to build that interoperability between the health plan and providers to transmit the data, to have it seamlessly uh, moving with all the regulations and compliance. I think it will take some time, but I'm very, very positive about having the solutions to integrate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on, <clears throat> in addition to the interoperability and, and creating a holistic viewpoint, um, what has been your experience so far from the patient trust uh, and, and their ability to say, yeah, I'm comfortable receiving care at home or virtually, or maybe a hybrid approach, um, the ability for them to 
maybe have some more transparency into who has access to their data and their PHI um, as all this converges into you know more centralized platforms. Uh, what has your experience been so far from a patient member experience perspective? And then how do industry players uh, account for that? Because that's something that's top of mind for, for us every single day and something that I, I feel like it should be top of mind for every single organization in healthcare. You know, I, if there is one impediment for um, you know this holistic virtual care programs to be successful, it is really about uh, the trust of data, uh, right? Um, it clearly, it, it's a concern. I'm very concerned for putting any of my data uh, in, in, in the web, right? I mean, I, I manage so much of our clients' data, but still I have that concern about my health data out there. Um, having a clear visibility, right? It's not about will it, not, that, that being secure, having a solution by which I'm able to participate and have visibility of how that data will be transmitted, who will have access to it and see it through will be so vital, right? Uh, for gaining the trust of that member. Today, all that you know is it's compliant with the regulations, but you don't know how it will be used, who uses it, how, what will they use it for? Those aspects, of data usage, compliance, holistic uh, management of data. If you're able to get the uh, members to have confidence, I think this will go a long way. That's a large problem today. I completely agree. I think that's a solution that uh, I look forward to that uh, from, you know, I'm really waiting for a solution that entrepreneurs can address that issue. Yeah. No, I, absolutely. It's, it's definitely top of mind and um, you're kind of, building the airplane as uh, it's going down right now when we're starting to adopt all these solutions at once. Um, maybe we'll change gears really quickly. Something you've, you've emphasized and focused on a lot is, is the shift from um, volume to value. And over the last two decades, if not more, um, there's been a tremendous amount of conversation around value-based healthcare and um, what that means to everyone. Um, and so I'd love to hear what value-based care means to you, your organization, um, how you're thinking and innovating around value-based solutions for your customers um, and helping them think about it as well in the future. Sure. Yeah, I know this, this is such an overused term. Uh, so I'll try to make it my own. And so that- uh, Please, please uh, do, please do. <laughs> value-based care is a model, uh, in, simply put, right? Uh, it's targeted towards improving health outcomes right? Improving somebody's health. That's really how I look at it. Um, the intention is to keep the cost down in improving somebody's health. That's the core intention. Uh, intends to create a reward structure uh, wherein the entire healthcare ecosystem, right, is targeted a single objective. That is, improve. you improve your member health and you get paid better not so much for how many visits is the person uh, having to the hospital. Yeah. I think to simply put, it's basically a financial model um, in healthcare where we move from fee-for-service to risk-based contracting. And that risk is stratified in the ecosystem and all the players in that ecosystem have one motto and one motto only, that is improve that member's health, right? So uh, from my uh, advantage point, working with the health plans, it's a fully capitated model, right? Um, that shows how some of the organizations define it, uh, wherein you're responsible for a group of patients, you're managing their health end-to-end. -end. You know, it could be a combination of telehealth, you know, hospital care, it could be a combination of home visits, but all that you are making sure is that person gets better. Um, I think it is really, it has taken a once, it has gone one step further during uh, COVID-19, I believe. Um, I see that a large number of players who were in value-based contracts, uh, they were more successful in their COVID-19 because the volumes were down from a utilization standpoint. And it also helped the health plans to reach out to the providers and drive this adoption during this time. Um, I also believe this has helped um, the health plans to devise value-based care programs wherein you use 
uh, in the retail terminology, I'll, I'll put some comparison, you know, provide right technology to deliver right quality of care at a location, right, uh, of the person's preference. So you use the word right, this, this terminology is very commonly used in retail. And I bring that, that is how I see value-based care being adapted. So it's a holistic management of health using technological solutions, member engagement, preferences, and make sure that the ecosystem is connected. That's how we, 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 we define it. Now, in terms of how we have helped our clients, look, conceptually, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, what I've said is uh, not complicated. What is difficult is bringing health plans and the providers to have a common orientation, to have their objectives aligned. Um, you know, when you have the risk-based contracts, I'm sure there are doubts about who's gaining the benefit. Uh, so what we help our clients is to have uh, our solutions and data analytics to help them with the whole value-based contracting process. That's one. Number two, we help our clients with data-driven solutions that can help in bundle contracts, bundle payments, you know, help them with the capitation model. And, you know, contracts, even if you get them out, you still have to measure the quality and the performance, right? So we help them in terms of measuring the quality quarter on quarter, helping proactively how they can improve it. And that is the kind of partnership we have in uh, the value-based contracting uh, uh, models. Got it. <clears throat> it's uh, certainly the way of the future. Um, and, and I think I agree with you 100% that COVID has shed a light on the need uh, to meet people where they're at at the right time with the right solution um, and leveraging technology to do that at scale uh, in a personalized approach. Um, we have a couple minutes left here, Shashi. I'd love to get your closing thoughts on uh, the future of technology's role in healthcare delivery um, and what you feel like is going to be something that's top of mind for everyone in the next one, two, three years as we look to continue to innovate in healthcare. Sure. Uh, I think I spoke about what's top of mind from uh, how patient care is impacted related to COVID-19. Uh, I strongly believe we'll continue, we'll continue to see technologies mature in terms of engagement. Clearly, you know, uh, we should see an omni-channel experience uh, for the member, right? That's one, uh, it's going to happen. Uh, we see a lot of the players from outside, the amount of startups coming in. Uh, I'm very, very positive about it. I talked about how telehealth becomes mainstream, part of healthcare delivery. I also believe it should extend towards holistic care, not just physical, right? Wherein you have physical, mental, behavioral, uh, technological solutions that are able to um, use data analytics to drive behavior, right? Uh, and drive change, that's massive. I talked about trusting. Uh, your solutions insights on AI are as good as your data. Uh, your ability to trust the data and arrive at insights that will, I would say, drive preventive measures for healthcare. That's where I have a biggest hope, wherein you have the health plan, the provider, and the medical uh, uh, pharma companies coming together, looking at the data, especially on AI and build AI solutions to prevent uh, some of the chronic conditions, to prevent, let's say, uh, a, a cancer. Can you detect cancer before it happens? Uh, you know and how cool that will be that you're able to trust the decision. So you can come up with a decision, but able to trust. I think that's where my biggest hope is that we will we'll be having a big leap in technology. Well, I uh, certainly look forward to a day when that becomes a reality. And uh, you know, for everyone listening, I hope uh, you continue to follow the work Entity is doing uh, in this space. Shashi, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. The conversation was fascinating and, and uh, I hope everyone uh, gained a tremendous amount of value from hearing your thoughts and perspectives uh, on technology's role in, in healthcare. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I uh, hope all is well in the future. Thank you, Sans. Appreciate it.